Now we want to talk about performing terrain analysis. The first step in performing terrain analysis is to talk about some pre basic principles, and you might want to look through this carefully. But basically what we want dependable, repeatable, iterative, and adaptable processes, and that we're considering using relative indices so that we're able to compare, but most of all that these have to be dynamic because the steps we'll go through might be different depending on the situation, the train or some auxiliary data. So that there's a, it's a repeatable iterative process that's adaptable. And you want to step through the principles and we'll talk a little more about these as we go along. So here's an example of using the flow accumulation, the catchment uh, concept we talked about before to identify gullies. And we had field verified these three gullies on Seven Mile Creek. Uh, tributary in Nicollet County and by running the flow accumulation and reclassifying it into those high values, those cells that are having many cells spill into them where there would be surface water, we'd predict there is surface water, uh, would be uh, forming a stream or a small uh, gully or rill that we would uh, we compare that to our field measurements and you can see that that in, in three of the cases they're fine, though there's a couple up here that we missed. Uh, and, and this could very well be some tiling involved or, or there's some uh, anomaly that we weren't able to uh, uh, see with our, um, our terrain model. Now this is another example where we're taking uh, an area in Blue Earth County where there's a, a extensive tiling going on in this, uh, in this surface. And we've gone through and field classified the, along this ditch uh, where there's side inlets, where there's gullies, where there's open intakes, and we've classified that uh, throughout the landscape and GPS those locations. Then we go about running the flow accumulation and looking at the very white areas, which would be the high accumulation, and you can see areas here that there's clearly a lot of drainage going on, uh, tiling that is uh, uh, below the surface that we're not seeing because there's water moving, or pred predicted water moving, and then it's disappearing uh, from our LIDAR-based uh, DEM. But you get an idea that where we have the surface water, you can see that we're predicting the surface water and some fairly good catchments. Uh, but the, the drainage here, we're not predicting much of a catchment at all because it's related to tiling. So it's a combination. It, it's giving us good information, but it's it's a combination of uh, field information and uh, then the uh, terrain model information. So there's a basic process. We establish our planning and do we do pre-processing? If we pre-process, we do what we talked about before. We, we fill, we filter, we burn in, we calculate the, the primary and secondary. If not, we just move right to the primary and secondary. We always would bring in the ancillary data, which would be the uh, aerial imagery, as we talked about, and ground truth. Then we go about our comparison and validating, and we'll have some examples here on that. Now, the, the uh, pre-planning sort of strategy. The first thing is develop the goals. Our, what scale are we working? Is it a landscape? Is it a field level? What's our end products? Uh, in, in terms of is it a flow network or erosion? Are we focused on upland or lowland? And then is it in-house or is it something we're going to... Uh, public. So all those make a difference in how we go about and the, the data that we accumulate and the indices we calculate. The, the next step in the pre-planning strategy is what's the nature of the landscape? Is it a high relief and dendritic? If so, maybe we, we fill in and uh, fill the sinks and we don't really care about it uh, very much. Or if it's very low relief, we might very well fill the pits and then run it filled and unfilled and maybe partially fill them using that Z factor we talked about before, about filling uh, to a certain level. So that there's, there's several different strategies and the landscape has to determine that. Then the ancillary data is very, very useful and that's the aerial imagery mostly, though there could be land use information, conservation practices, distance to water, but a lot of our ancillary information comes from the aerial imagery but you can so you have to remember that our terrain attributes are just from the topographical features so we've got to put some of uh, that other information into the puzzle 
then we uh, uh, have to uh, make sure that we were able to understand those unexplained anomalies, the tiling that we showed before. Uh, and, and that's why ground truthing is not replaced by this aerial because it's dated for one reason, but the other is you can't see the drain tile so that you, uh, or always see the drain tile, so that there would be your culverts, so that there would be, uh, the ground truthing is very, very important. You've got to get out and do at least something, whether it be a detailed one or a windshield. So it's very important in comparing the field level to our calculated, our predicted values out of our models and uh, understanding how accurate. Now, when we're doing the comparisons, we've got, we have to uh, compare apples to apples. So we've gone out and field GPS these, uh, uh, these, these survey points, and here we can see, hey, there's a pretty good matchup. Here's the 95 percentile where the stream power index, where there's steep slope and, and lots of flow accumulation. So, uh, but we've got some areas like over here, that we're we're not there, there's pretty good stream power index pretty good slope but we're not connecting it to the ditch or the stream so that there's some other uh, information that we have to bring together um, now when we compare these we would classify them in did we was it there and we didn't get it or did we predict it was there and it wasn't so there's a type one and a type two whether we were false positive or false negative. So out of the 126 uh, that we had predicted, there really were only 83. And if you look gully by gully, that here, this one we were very good at. We identified with our uh, terrain models, we were able to identify 31 out of 32, and here 17 out of 22. And uh, and so this one we, were, we, we uh, weren't quite as good at. And you can see that overall we were saying there was a, a gully, uh, but there wasn't. They're, they're saying there was a, uh, a false positive, uh, saying there was a positive and there wasn't. And you get an idea how you would set that matrix up to compare your, um, what you're, you predicted as to what's observed. Now the important thing when you're comparing your results is not just comparing apples to apples, but you're also putting them in some type of percentile ranking so that you're able to, within the landscape, do the percentile and then it would be scalable so that you could say the percentile of this very large scale is field level compared to the percentile of the entire county, uh, the ranking of the entire county. So you could compare apples to apples if you're using a, a ranking system. So it eliminates some guessing of some random values and it allows that, that very important comparison between different scales. And how you go about verifying this is you want to make sure you do your, your plot of your values, your percentile ranking, but then uh, put into it your observed side input va uh, values to actually see if they're accumulating in the higher stream power index, which is where they should be. Then the, the uh, other issue with the percentile ranking is you can't do it in ArcGIS as easily. You're often throwing the data out and using Excel uh, in a simple sense or putting it in some stats package uh, so that you're able to uh, create those, those rankings and establish those percentiles, whether they be in uh, deciles or, or uh, uh, quartiles, whatever uh, grouping you want, but you, you want to make sure you're doing that percentile ranking because it's important for the comparison. Then after you've got some information that's actionable, you're starting to, to talk about prioritizing. But remember, we're only accounting for the terrain analysis. We didn't bring in the external data that well in this, the, our model. So the proximity to the water, the, lands, the relative position, uh, some costs, some remediation, all of those things have to be brought in while you're establishing your priorities. And then the, the GIS can be helpful again where you're actually putting it on a map and helping uh, for public presentation, where you're actually showing here are the critical areas uh, or, and here is above certain threshold, threshold so that you're able to say that for a very uh, um, small scale uh, compared to a very large scale, here being the very small scale, here the being very large scale so that we're able to, to deal with that and our percentiles allow us to, to, uh, to flip between them very easily. So caveats, limits. Same as LIDAR. It's, it's costly, it depends on the computer and the training, and it doesn't replace a lot of legwork and field work. 
Uh, it's something that does uh, a very, very good job uh, at a general to a mid-level, but you need a lot of field work uh, to actually translate it to the very, very large scale, to the um, to the most detailed level, because it doesn't it, it mis misunderstands man-made structures uh, and treats them as if they're same as natural, or misses underground tiling or culverts and those sorts of things. So that we have to go through quite a number of steps of burning them in and hydrological conditioning. So the, they're only as good as you're, you put the input in here as you work with in terms of the data and your assumptions and your effort. So it, it's only surface flow and you want to remember it's only surface flow um, though you're able to bring in a lot of information uh, as you're providing that hand detail, that ground information that you're able to um, uh, as you're, you're adjusting the computer based uh, based on the field level uh, information that you're bringing directly in. But there isn't an automated way for that. It's step by step. There isn't one size fits all. It's quite a, um, uh, a detailed, um, uh, time intensive process. That concludes this talk.